After the end of the Sultanate era, the Indian coin system fell into disarray. Sher Shah tried to revitalize it. Babur and Humayun also introduced some reforms. However, the reign of Akbar ushered in a new era. Akbar not only introduced new coins made of gold, silver and copper, but also set up new mints, brought in uniformity and introduced an appropriate monetary policy. So it can be said that the Mughal coin system, including its spread and quality, was no accident, but the result of long-term planning and meticulous execution. The particular feature of the Mughal coinage is that it is of very uniform standard and of very high quality as well. The Mughals had introduced certain new coins, but they did not uh, leave behind entirely or absolutely the coins of their predecessors. And one can see that the Mughal coinage system has evolved through a large number of experiments running over long years of work. The Mughal coinage system has been acclaimed as one of the best coins in the world during the medieval period. So it is necessary for us to understand a little bit of the experiments made by the Mughals and then how this uniformity and high quality were maintained by the Mughals and then what were the results of this kind of increased uh, issue of the coins during the end of the 17th and early 18th century. Before Sher Shah's reign, the principal coinage of the Delhi Sultanate was secondary. Initially, it was made of unalloyed silver, but gradually it became highly debased with copper and bronze. The time of Sher Shah, we find that the principal coin had become one, it was mainly of copper, although actually it was earlier a silver rupee or silver tanka, but it had come down with alloy of copper and bronze, etc., so much that it had become practically a copper coin. This was called the secondary, while the earlier one, the one of the silver tanka of the Sultanate, just before Shersha was called Dehli Wala. Shersha suppressed Dehli Wala because it was practically of no use and uh, the secondary continued. But what Shersha did was he started a new silver coin called Rupi or Rupaiya. At the same time, he reorganized the copper coin and it was called Paisa. So it was the rupee or rupeya, which was a silver coin, and Paisa, which was a copper coin. The coinage of Shersha therefore constituted of two metals and it continued during his successors. In 1526, Barber introduced coinage compatible with Asian standards. The silver coin he introduced was called Sharuki. It was bigger in size than the coins then in vogue, but thinner at the same time. Barber had seen such coins while he was in Kabul. It was in vogue till Humayun's exile in 1540. After coming back in 1555, Humayun found that there were several kinds of coins prevalent in India. The one was called Sharuki, which was already there, 
which was prevalent in Punjab and in Kabul region, there was the rupee or rupaya, which was in the Delhi or northern India, and there was also the copper coin, the paisa. Now, the lodis, that is before the shows had come, the lodis had only one mint at Delhi. Shersha had established mints at various places, two in Bihar, five in Bengal, and several in northern India. So he had a large number of mints, and the historians had often wondered that why there was a sudden jump, sudden increase in the number of mints between the Lodis and the Sos. We'll come to that question a bit later. With Akbar's ascension to the throne, he continued with the system of coinage introduced by his predecessors. During his reign, there were coins made of silver, known as rupee, and those made of copper, called paisa. Akbar later modified the system introduced by Sher Shah. Now, Akbar's made a slight difference, a slight modification of the policy of Sher Shah. Sher Shah had increased the number of mints, which means also the increase of the number of coins. But there was no particular policy behind the increase of the number of mints. But Akbar now took a particular policy. His policy was that every province should have a one mint at least. Every big city should have one mint. And every administrative center should have a mint. So, Akbar's policy was, in short, increase the number of mints as much as possible. Now, we shall see that at the end of the reign of Aurangzeb, the number of mints of the Mughal Empire had increased to a new height, which could not be reached by the successors of Aurangzeb even. Now, Akbar's coin, the rupee was a round one. It weighs 178 grain of troy, which was a more or less a standard. There was an alloy, a mixture of 4% of bronze or copper. Now, Aurangzeb increased it to 180 grain of troy. But the mixture continues. Jahangir started two new silver coins, which are far more heavier. But these silver coins did not last long, and they had to be abundant. During the time of Aurangzeb, not only the number of coins had increased, but also the number of mints had increased. So we find that there is an evolution of the Mughal coinage system from Babur to Aurangzeb, from Sharukhi to Rupiah. No gold coin has been found dating beyond 1530, the year of Timur's attack. Sher Shah is known to have minted some gold coins. However, these were not for circulation but mainly for commemorative and ceremonial purposes, as also for hoarding and luxurious spending by the aristocrats. Akbar later introduced gold coins and established four mints to produce them. Now, Akbar continued that policy. In 1577, he started minting gold coins not necessarily for commemorative purposes or for ceremonial purposes, which were there, but that those were not the only reasons. And he wanted the gold coins to continue. Four mints were established in the Mughal Empire, and they produced gold coins. But the gold coins 
were mainly used by the aristocracy or the nobility for the hoarding under the ground or for their own personal luxurious spending. Therefore, in 1577, we find for the first time, perhaps, if we take the circulation of gold coin as valid, that the Mughal coinage system is based on three metals, gold, silver, and copper. Needless to say that silver was the most prominent, most predominant one might say, of all the coins. But for a time, copper held the field, particularly during the time of Akbar. During the whole of Akbar's reign, the principal coins were made of copper called dam. These were rather heavy coins, weighing 330 grains of troy. These were not inscribed with religious symbols or a ruler's name. The Persian inscription mentioned only the year of issue and the name of the mint. Dam was the principal medium of transaction, used even for the purpose of revenue collection, payment of salary and settling other imperial transactions. Abul Fazal, Elizaini Akbari, had given the list of the Mansabdas getting salaries or other people, other officials getting salaries. These are all given in copper coins, that is the dam. Even the revenue figures that Abul Fazal had given are all given in copper coins. There is no mention of rupee. But we get the reference of the rupee for the first time in 1592-93 in the Mughal document. It was only a passing reference. And one may presume without much dispute, that at least up to 1600, Akbar died in 1605, at least up to 1600, the copper coin, that is the dam, was used as money of account as well as the money of payment. In Bengal, it was, of course, a little bit different. In Bengal, there was the tanka or the silver coin, the rupee, and then we have the shells, she shells called kauris. The reason is that in Bengal, the price was far lower than those of northern India. And therefore, for the ordinary people, for going to the market, etc., it was much better to pay in curry. One curry is practically nothing if we compare it, because 2,500 curries make one silver tanka or one silver rupee. One can understand the price prevailing in Bengal in those days. From the time of Shah Jahan, a copper mixed with silver called Anna started in Bengal, which was one sixteenth of a rupee, and it became quite popular during the end of Shah Jahan's reign, and it continued ever since. But in Gujarat, there was another kind of coin called Mahmudi, after 1600, this Mahmudi was replaced by rupee. After the conquest of Golconda and Bijapur by Aurangzeb, their coinage was suppressed and rupee replaced them. The coinage of Bijapur and Golconda was called Hun, H-U-N. So therefore, the Mughal coinage spread quite slowly throughout India but very fast if we look at the Mughal Empire itself. 
and the particular feature remained that it remained a very high standard, a very high quality, totally uniform, etc. The coins introduced by Akbar differed in some respects from those introduced by Sher Shah, while the former had Arabic as well as the Nagari inscriptions, the latter had inscriptions in Arabic only. Akbar's coins, the silver one, as well as the gold, has in the obverse, that is in the front, in Arabic script, the Kalima and the names of the four companions of the Khalifa. In the reverse, there was the name of the king, the name of the mint, and the name of, and the year of the issue, which was very important as we shall see. In case of copper coins, the name of the king is not mentioned. But this is a departure from the days of Shersha. In Shersha's rupee or rupiah, there were two scripts simultaneously used in the same coin, Arabic and Devanagari. But Akbar did not use Devanagari. In certain coins of the mint of Jaunpur, which has a very good influence of the Safavid dynasty of Persia, he has used Persian. In copper coin, Persia was used, because this was considered to be the coin of the ordinary people who do not know much Arabic. The coinage system during Akbar's reign evolved over a period of time through trial and error. If one wants to ascertain the reason behind the large quantity as also the high quality of these coins, one will need to understand the structure of European coinage of the 16th and 17th centuries. In the 15th and the 16th centuries, the Spanish people had gone to South America Peru, Mexico, Brazil, etc., and had taken away lots of bullion of gold, silver, and copper from their mines to Europe. This amount of precious metals imported into Europe caused change in price level in Europe itself which had been termed by the historians as price revolution. The Spaniards used to put this gold, silver, and copper in the port of Cadiz, and the merchants used to take, rather buy, these gold, silver, and copper, and take these to Asia, most prominently in India, to buy commodities and goods. From the 17th century, the East India Company also followed this practice. So what happened was that there were several ways of gold, silver, and copper of South America coming to India via Europe. Actually, in the Middle East, there was a port called Mocha, where the Indian merchants used to go, sell their cloth and other products in exchange of gold, silver, and copper coins, or even bullions, which is why this port of Mocha is called the treasury of the great Mughals. Foreigners accounts, as also domestic sources, maintain that India began importing large volumes of gold and silver from the latter half of the 17th century. These were used in the Mughal mints 
for producing high quality coins. But the exact volumes of import of precious metal and bullion or production of coins remain debatable. One foreign traveler stated that the end of the 17th century, the foreign metals, precious metals in the shape of coinage, bullion, etc., had come to the amount of 100 pound crore, crore of pounds, which is quite a fantastic one. Nowadays, there were two articles on this, one by Nazaf Haider of Delhi University and the other by Shirin Musfi of Aligarh Muslim University. Nazaf Haider and Shirin did not have much difference so far as the import of the precious metals is concerned. They stated that the importation was more or less, according to both of them, was more or less the same, something like 30.6 metric tons per year. But the issue of the Mughal coinage, there was a difference. Nazaf Haider did not give more than, less than 80.6, which is quite a different one than that of Shirin Musfi. There is a very big difference. So there is a question of the controversy, which has not yet been settled, but it continues. But it shows that the importation of precious metals went largely to constitute the basic element of the coinage of the Mughals during the 17th century. And in this coinage, there were certain other associate elements in it. For example, we see that there was the paper credit called Hundi, or in P Persian language, Surfa. And this was a kind of a promissory note given to a person promising to pay a certain sum of money on a certain time at a certain rate with a small discount. There was also the banking system the bankers, the Mahajads used to accept the deposit of money, give interest. They also give loans with interest. There was also the insurance in which money was used to a great extent. So in case of the history of the monetary system of Mughal India, we see that the inflation did not particularly become heavy due to increased trade and commerce, due to increased urbanization, due to increased production and demand for goods. But it did help to establish the Mughals on a solid basis. <laughs> Thank you.